explain again about this factor of two. For the resolution of the if you remember for the resolution you have a if you have a circular tool of diameter D, right, then the angular resolution you get is, is about let's not worry about the 1.22 or so, it's about lambda over D. Okay? Then we said we can add in the telescope a central obscuration. And if that's really big, we've seen in the optics class that this has an effect here. So the actual resolution apparently is a bit, a bit uh, higher. So say a bit. No, they're yeah, higher. It actually should be small, right? So. Now, now, how can we explain this qualitatively? You could also say that, well, in order to form an image, you would have all points in this aperture interfering with each other. And the ones that are farther out contribute more to the resolution that you can get, to the high frequencies, than the ones in the center. So if you take them out of the center, you have more contributing, relatively speaking, more from only the other parts. So that's why your, your resolution, if you have a big central obscuration, is actually a bit better. Now, I then went from a single aperture to the barometer, where I said they're separated by a baseline B. And if I use that simple analogy from here, my resolution would be about lambda over B. Right? This was what was asked in the test. But of course, we also have this factor here in heat, because there's if this is missing, and we have only the interference from the outermost parts, like in this case where we don't part of the same, the resolution is in fact better. And in fact, and this was the number that you find in the handouts. So this is why you find there lambda over 2b. Okay? But then again, this factor depends on the actual configuration. So this is. But usually, I mean, this is we're doing astronomy here. Right? If you're within a factor of two, everything is fine. <laughs> okay, now let's let's come back today to the to the to the top to the most frequently used and so far unexplained topic. Uh, and this is really a, a key technology for large telescopes. I think without adaptive optics. No one would even consider building telescopes, optical telescopes, larger than the current generation of six or eight or ten meters. Okay, so of course the technique of adaptive optics is to take out atmospheric turbulence. Okay. Let us start so with a, a reminder on atmospheric turbulence, then I'll explain to you the basic principles of adaptive optics. We'll look at the key components of adaptive optic systems. And then the, the driest part, maybe, but a very important one are what's called the error curves, essentially the limitations. Why adaptive optics is not the non plus ultra or scoping whole problems that you might have in imaging. And then typically we, uh, we talk we look into the laser guide stars and uh, uh, to round everything off, we look at a handful of different types of AO concepts. All of them you will find at some telescope somewhere, if not now. Okay, so let's start with a reminder on the atmospheric turbulence. If your, if your memory still serves you well from last week, you may remember that the Russian mathematician Kolmogorov has provided theoretical framework to 
described turbulence. This is the one we're using, but what it basically we just say that the sun is eating the, the, uh, the air, you have winds coming in, you have uh, the heat from the ground, uh, the sun heats up the ground in the, in the, during the day, and then at night, of course, the ground is still radiating and producing uh, a warmer layer of air here than maybe further up. So all of that uh, contributes to turbulence. And of course, well, we know that the turbulence means we have temperature fluctuations, and the temperature is related to the refractive index of the air, and the refractive index is related uh, to the optical cast difference. And so this is what disturbs our way. And so, with all that, we have an outer scale, which is the largest size of our turbulence. And of course, that's not only scale, but the turbulence breaks down in many smaller parts. And again, I mean, if you don't believe me, just, just take a, a bottle of whatever aquacon gas and shake it. Yeah, and, and look quickly at the bubbles, and you see a few big bubbles, and you see many small ones, and a tiny number of very small bubbles. I'm not saying necessarily this is following a normal normal spectrum, but it gives you an idea. So at some point, you, at some point, you reach a smaller, bigger scale, and, and, and these are the smaller numbers. But in all these, there is sort of a characteristic scale length. And this characteristic scale length is given by the so-called free parameter. Remember, this is what we discussed last, last uh, week. And we said, well, we get a turbulent wavefront, but when we look at the turbulence, maybe I should draw maybe a free front, a free drawing again, just to remind you. Okay, let's say we have a case of strong turbulence. So we have, above the atmosphere, we have a plane wave front coming in from an object of infinity, and then it goes through all these, these turbulent cells of the atmosphere, and this is our turbulent wave front. Okay, and then, And of course, so the wavefront is disturbed, and it has all to do, it's all to do with respect to the wavelengths of the light that we look at. You could also imagine to draw the wavelengths of the light here. And so, obviously, a small, relatively small distortion will not hurt much with respect to a wavelength that is so large. But of course, if we have a distortion bending of the wavefront, that is that large, with respect to wavelengths that is only that far, it will completely mess up our image. Uh, so then, we are not says, well, we find, uh, we find an average size scale over which the, the, the phase distortion is one radian or less. So in this case of our large turbulence, I think if we say, well, we look at the scales where the distortion is small, well, obviously, it must be smaller than that because there is very large. So I think, well, maybe, maybe if we say some, some, this is a typical distance, right? Because you can take this distance anywhere, and within that interval, yeah, maybe here, but within that interval, not much is changing. Here is a little tilted, but okay. So this is our knot in our case of large speed. Okay, and now we have a wavefront, and we have a very quiet night, very little turbulence, so then the radiation, uh, the, the, this is our wavefront now. And we can see that with respect to our wavelengths, the size scales over which we can see those fluctuations are much larger. Right? So, in this case, from here to here, so the tilt, we could only go 
small distance from here to here, it's a large distance. So in the case of our quiescent atmosphere, this turbulence are not the same. Typically on a good side, for, for visible wavelengths, this could be something like 30 centimeters. If you have a bad, bad night, this is only a few centimeters. I don't know. Maybe five centimeters. Okay. But in any case, you can always find sort of a typical scale size over which you say the wavefront is flat. And you define with your kind of flat simply by saying the distortion is less than a phase shift of one radius. Okay, so I hope you remember this because this is very important when we design the adaptive water system. Okay, and there are a couple of scaling relations. Um, maybe the distances are not increases with the wavelengths, and uh, then the long exposure, what we can get, that is the resolution. And remember what we said before about the fracture limit, lambda over D, now if we have seen. Turbulence is not out of our When you plug this in, then you can also see that the C is slowly improving when you go to longer wavelengths. So uh, there is also, uh, of course, a time scale involved because this is not a static picture here. Right? Of course, all that is fluctuating with time, and so the time over which this can be seen as constant is given by this coherence time, and that also has to do with R0, but it also, of course, has to do with the wind speed, because the wind is blowing everything around. So this is our atmospheric coherence time. And then finally, we have, uh, we have defined an isoplanetic angle, where, which is the angle over which the wavefront error is less than one radian. And you have to remember that again, if we, let's say we look at one star here with our telescope, right, and here is our turbulence. And let's say we could measure that and correct for it. But then we look at another star here, for example. We would have to be within our field, so of course they're at infinity, so imagine, imagine they're for up, for up. But then we would look in this direction, right, for this function, it's really not a problem. This one. So if we look to this object, of course, we suddenly sample, sample a different part of the atmosphere, right? Now we look through this part, I mean, this is the part we have in common. But to that star, we look from here to here through the turbulent atmosphere. To this star, we look from here to here. This is the common part. This part only applies to this star. This part only applies to this star. And so they don't suffer the same turbulence, the two different field points. And that means that the wavefront information here is different from the wavefront information here. And this isoplanetic angle sets a upper limit on how different it can be. And again, it's defined as a phase shift of one radian, and uh, it's given by this equation uh, where eta is the sinus distance and h is the height where the turbulence in the atmosphere where the turbulence occurs. I haven't been able to understand why the, if the atmospheric, atmospheric coherence time is of the order of 0.1 seconds or okay, mm -hmm. the, the hundred of seconds, the active of optics, uh, optics system is um, functioning at milliseconds time scales. If, if you have plenty of space and it's so fast. Why are they not in so fast? Well, 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 maybe we can get to that later on when we discuss the AO system. Yes. That's a good point. But I also think your point one second is 
bit in the optimistic in many cases. But okay, but your, your point is well taken. It's this one. Okay, now you see this before, right? We need the AL system to improve resolution and sensitivity. This is the whole point. Compared to the images, you see structure here, details that you don't see, and you also see more main sources. And so we want to get to this image, and in order to take out the atmosphere, we built an adaptive context. I should remind you that you must not confuse adaptive optics, which corrects turbulence, with a term we've heard before when we discussed telescopes, making active optics. Remember, active optics was just a support for the primary mirror. We had a thin primary mirror, and we said, well, it's flexing, so we put some motors and actuators underneath and made sure that it uh, stays in shape. But that only controls the mirror shape every few minutes. Active optics will not take care of the atmospheric turbulence. This is a completely different optic. Okay, so let me first say uh, explain what the idea is. Maybe you can have guessed already about the discussion. So if we have a maximum scale, which is in the order of R0, the free parameter, where we say this is what we can tolerate as, as wavefront aberrations, this is where the wavefront is still sort of flat, then we have to subdivide the telescope aperture into pieces of R0. And then we have to measure somehow the wavefront ever and the wavefront deformations. And we'll get information on the local deformations on scales of R0. And then we somehow have to correct those ever and these deformations. And we can correct them, of course, or we should be able to correct them maybe by by bending the wavefront back. We can do this, of course, most easily with a mirror. We reflect something, we make sure that the mirror is not flat, then the reflected wavefront will also uh, keep the information from the surface of the mirror. Okay, so the idea is, in this case, there is a primary mirror, and the primary mirror is much larger than mine. Now, of course, we said before the primary mirror is not We said before R0 on a good side is something like 10 centimeters or 30 centimeters. So this is not always given. If you remember last week when I asked the famous uh, astronomer from Bogota, Rafael, uh, he said he has a telescope at home. Yeah? And I think that telescope was smaller than the 30 centimeters. But so in this case it would not apply to this telescope. If you go to bigger telescopes, you can assume that you have always multiple equivalents of R0 turbulent cells above your average. In fact, the most simple case, since of course it's a you have to give me two dimensions, it's just T over R0, which gives you the number of cells. Right? So, simple case, if you have a telescope aperture of size D, e, right, and say whatever D e is one meter, and your, your uh, R0 is whatever, maybe D e is in 33 centimeters, right, then you would. Simplified picture, you would get essentially, oops, that part, but three R knots across the diameter. And I mean, we can now screw around with 33 over 2 times a squared times pi or whatever, but let's, let's not worry. Let's just say then if there are three in one dimension, there would be nine in two dimensions. Okay? So this is about the number of. Sub-aperture, you will see that on your table. Okay, finally, we get to the AO principle. Let's assume you have the incoming line. Ideally, you would have a flat wavefront with the turbulence is distorted now. And let's assume we somehow we 
view, I mean, reflected on the mirror here, we somehow can change the shape of the mirror. Then we just have to make sure, if we know how this looks like, that we bend this mirror uh, to a shape which is exactly the opposite of the incoming wavefront. Well, since it's a reflection, it should be half of the opposite. Okay. Right, so, so in other words, uh, the, here the wavefront is, is, uh, is, is ahead of the, the average. So we would have to push the mirror a little bit to, no, we have to bend it back, sorry. You have to bend it back because here we need to add some extra path lengths to make it bend back to the average wavefront. Whereas in this case, where it's behind, we push the mirror out a little bit so that it has to travel less far. And so it will be. Okay, now, and then, then we send the light, if it was corrected, to our wavefront. And here we have a flat uh, wavefront, and this will give us a perfect view. Of course, we need to know somehow how the wavefront looks like. And therefore, we put in the beam splitter in. The beam splitter is just a, a crystal that reflects part of the light and captures some of the light. So we get always some light on the camera, and we reflect some of the beam, some of the intensity of the light, to our wavefront sensor. And that wavefront sensor analyzes how the wavefront looks like, and then sends that information, that's of course optical information, uh, then uh, to a control system, and that control system then analyzes the information here, and knows how to control the mirror, and, well, you can already see the design considerations that you need to know. Because the number of, of, of elements here, where you have to push your mirror back up and down, this is the number of here of d over r naught squared Right, so you have, you have essentially one one actuator, one, one element to control the local wavefront uh, per or not. And you need to compute things and update the shape here faster than your coherence time down. Okay? This is about. No questions so far? Have you seen this before? Model of the wavefront. So not have it ex 
exactly measures at infinite resolution. So I'm interested in a model that approximates the wavefront on the scales that are important, on the scales of R. And so the mathematical model I use here is a series of 30 component names. Now that's named after, after uh, Fritz Schrödinger, uh, who was a, a physicist in, in Groningen in Holland. He also won the Nobel Prize in, in the 50s for, for the phase contrast microscope. And uh, he was also developing a lot of the, the background of the theory of the optical system. And what, what you see here, this is mathematically speaking, this is a, a series of orthogonal polynomials. <coughs> and they essentially, well, I, I hope you can sort of get this idea here. So this is essentially just a flat value, an offset. This is essentially a tilt in the vertical direction, this is a tilt in the horizontal direction. These are higher order terms already, as you can see, but they're still fairly simple. Okay? So the idea here is that rather than measuring an infinite resolution, our wavefront, we just measure it to a certain point and then describe the actual wavefront by just a series so that the sum of a combination of theirs. I mean, in principle, this idea is not so much different from what we've seen before for Fourier series, where we have the sum of different sines and cosine functions. Only here we have different, uh, different terms here. I didn't even uh, give you an expression for those individual uh, mathematically turning the term, terms, but uh, so this is just a visualization. But you can see. You can essentially approximate, this of course goes for you, right? You can, you can have this the large numbers. But for most, uh, in most cases, you can, uh, you can construct or approximate your wavefront by just adding, with the right weight, some of these together. And then this, this uh, gets you close to the actual weight. This is something like spherical harmonics in. So, they are related to something like that? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, in, in some way, certainly, but uh, I, know, I can't tell you all. I will see more things. Oh, this is, this is, uh, yeah. I mean, the shape here, this is too beautiful. So, we always talk here about the wavefront shape across the view. So consider this to be your, your whatever one meter telescope. Right? And then you say, well, something is wrong with my for me, with my wavefront of the four meters. Right? I mean, of course it doesn't work so easily here, but let's say, let's say this were my wavefront. Yeah? So I would know, well, maybe I have a little bit of that term. It also looks like I may have a bit of that term because overall it looks a bit too this way. Right? And then you say, but there is a, a, a dip in the center. So I probably have a strong component from that term. Okay, so I have that one. And then, but it's also a bit asymmetric, right? There is more here than here. So maybe I have a bit of that one, but you see how this is going. Maybe you just add more and more of these terms, and then you get closer and closer to the edge. And, okay, now, now here are the numbers, if you want to compute it, for the, the terms. And this is actually what their name is. So the simple offset, so that means a simple a phase piston is a phase shift for the whole aperture. That would be introduced if you just move your primary mirror a bit back and forth. Then you have tip tilt. And this was the this is the tip tilt, where it's just an overall tilt across the wavefront. Then you have higher orders like astigmatism, focus, astigmatism. 
magnetism, E focus, free fall, coma. So some of the aberrations we've had we've seen before for geometric optics are included there too. Only then beyond coma, I think we're running out of, of terms that we recognize. They don't have famous names anymore, but of course the aberrations continue. It's just more complex. Okay, so this is the mathematical framework that our computer is actually working with. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons why this is important here is also that not all of these terms contribute with the same power or the same, they don't provide the same contribution to our wavefront application. And this is illustrated here. This is the certainly the coefficient, or well, let's say it's the, the contribution to the turbulence for, for a certain model uh, as a function of this index. Okay. Now what is the index? The index is simply, if we go back here, index uh, at zero is index one was the tilt, index two is astigmatism and focus, and so on. Not like before with multiple images that are all uh, uh, mixing up. 
Now he has only one image, but that one image is moving around. But that's now easy. Because that's like, like uh, well, you take, you take an image at night with your pocket camera, and, and then it gets fussy simply because you're moving the camera. Right? So, I mean, it's better to take a tripod or something and put your camera on top, then it's, it's fixed. If you don't have that and you tremble somehow, you of course it becomes a fuzzy image. You introduce, but you only introduce the tilt, right? You don't use a complex turbulence. Right? You only if you if you stop moving it in this way or in this way, it's sharp image. It's a sharp image. Right? So this is the tilt term. If you have a small telescope, that's all you need to worry about. But if you have a big telescope, you may still have an overall tilt of the wavefront. And, I mean, of course we can draw this differently. We can also say that this wavefront here would be like... So you would have the tilts of the different cells and an overall tilt as well. And this is what's shown here. So there is always an overall image motion, but you can imagine that the bigger the telescope, the less relevant is the contribution of this tilt component. So if you have a 10 meter telescope, this would actually look different, then it's, it's much smaller. The smaller the telescope, relatively speaking, the more important the tilt term is with respect to the higher order operations. Okay. Then you have a, 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 a 
might have evaporated away from. So that means that, for example, here we have a tilt. So that waveform, or meaning the tilt, meaning that uh, the rays from there are actually going in that direction. So if you focus it with this convex by convex lens, the centroid of your image will not be here anymore, but here. Okay. And that means that your points in the, in the image plane will move around. But you know where they're supposed to be for a, for a flat wave run. And now the points are offset with respect to the nominal position. And of course that offset, and I mean if you look at, let's say, uh, this is, uh, what's a nice offset? I, I think this one is right here, it's here. For the flat point, let's say, this one is now, let's say, corresponds to that part. We know how much it has moved, and because of that, we know how large the tilt of the wavefront was, and this is what we want to know. Okay, so we we now know, okay, this this has been because this has moved by whatever hundred micrometers of the detector. We know that the wavefront is locally tilted by five degrees. And the size of the lens. Lens needs to be a, a scale from R0 to the size in the plane, focal plane. Right. So, I mean, essentially, if you, if you do it correctly, then you should, you should uh, subdivide it in as many lens, at least. I mean, you can always use more. In as least as many uh, lenses as you have R0. Otherwise, you lose information. You would not be able to. Turbulence on the relevant scales of our Okay, so this is a, by the way, this has nothing, this check Hartman test, this has nothing to do with adaptive optics primarily. It's being used in an adaptive optics system. But this is a very common method to measure waveforms. Or even, even for any, any telescope, if you, uh, if you, if you buy, it, or if you build, I buy a telescope on a manufacturer, they have to polish the mirror, and how do they know the mirror is, is right? Well, they make a test similar to that. They try to light on it, and uh, there are other methods. But this is also uh, something you can do all the time. You put in a, 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 for any optical system, you put in such a wavefront sensor, and it will tell you about the operations of the mirror. Is this, uh, has this become clear? This is very important. So in order to confuse you, I show you another method that can also be used and that, that some adaptive optic systems use. And that's called a curvature sensor. And I, I'm, well, thank, I'm not doing this to confuse you, but I'm doing this to uh, make sure that you understand the principle. Like, like what we want to accomplish, how we want to measure away from it. And there are always Several ways. So it's actually not so important what, what the Shek Hartman sensor does, but it's more important that you understand the concept of, of uh, there is this distorted wavefront in the pupil and the camera. Let's assume um, we put this, um, let's assume that there is uh, the incoming wavefront in the pupil, and because As we said here, in the pupil plane, the wavefront is tilted. No points. So overall, it's distorted in some way. And because of that, the, the light rays are not parallel anymore. So that means that if they're not parallel anymore, I mean, for a polymeric scheme where the light is parallel, let's say the amount of light probably Elena would call this the energy density. Uh, so the amount of light per unit area for a parallel beam, of course, would be the same. If you have this tilt here, and you go out of, out of this uh, central pupil position where you measure it, if you have a tilt like that, if you go to the one side, 
couple of millimeters, let's say, you would actually find less light here because, because it diverges here. The density of rays, the amount of light, is actually less than here because here you have the, 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 the light converging and you have more rays, more, more photons, whatever I, I want to look at it, in this particular area. And if you measure this here and here and take the comparison, this is the difference, then because you have a lack of illumination here and excess of illumination here, if you take the difference, you would see it. And this can be done actually very easily. Uh, some systems actually use a loudspeaker. And if you imagine you have a loudspeaker membrane <coughs> with a mirror, and you run your loudspeaker, and then the membrane with your, with your mirror is either here or here, just going back and forth. The beauty is you can see and you can hear when the systems work. You go to the observatory and you hear and you know the loudspeaker, the loudspeaker is on, it's moving the membrane continuously at, at a few hundred hertz back and forth. And then uh, some, some uh, CCD, fast readout, reads that and just subtracts the images. And of course, if the way if the planes are, if that plane, if that way from that plane would be flat, the planes, uh, these rays would be parallel. The light here and here would be the same, and the, the difference would be zero. Okay? And if you have a tilt here, there is a difference in illumination. The difference is not zero, and, and you can easily see that. And then uh, you don't have also. So there are many ways to measure the wavefront, and we'll now assume we know what the wavefront is. I'm, I want to be sure that I understood this, but how can you measure the, 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 the wavefront without interfering with the propagation of the wavefront? Um, oh, okay, well, well, the, the, the Okay, I mean there are various ways of interference. Oh. You make the measurement outside the science team anyway, uh, right? You, you always have a beam splitter, so you don't have to worry that this, this beam will, will be received by your camera. Okay, so, so what you do in this case then is, well you have the beam coming in, you have the, the, the mirror here reflecting it back somewhere, and then you have the lens that, that, that images it onto a CCD. Actually, these two, two planes are not in the same and are not the same in the, in the same. So they're not the same. They're along the optical axis. So the optical axis goes from here to here. You just need small tilt disentangle. I mean, this may be, I mean, this is more counter, this is more intuitive, or easier to grasp at first. The problem with that is that you need a fairly complex array of small lenses. In this case here, you only need a loudspeaker. In principle, this could be a student project. Build a curvature wavefront center. I mean, you, find, you find components in, in all the electronic stores, and some fast Whereas here you have to spend real money to build a wavefront sensor camera like that, you spend whatever hundreds of kilo dollars. <laughs> okay, well, oh, good cheaper. Okay, so now we know how the wavefront looks like, what we're going to do. We approximate the wavefront, we try to approximate it with our mirror. We said we do a piecewise linear fit on the scales of R0. And this is of course exaggerated. So we have here the wavefront, and we just say, well, this is the size of R0. So we just compute the shape of the R0, which are the local shapes that we want to control. And then, well, we can make segmented mirrors, small mirrors that are subject to that pedestal, tiny little mirrors. I mean, usually those deformable mirrors are of that size. And 
So making those usually means uh, they're, they're micro-machined or etched. You can also um, do this, say you have a base here, some, some material, uh, just some apple, and then there are piezoelectric crystals here. You know what piezoelectric crystals are? So you, you, those are interesting, nice crystals, you apply a voltage and then they contract or expand. So you, you, have a, you have a control over the landscape, not by much, but we only need, I mean, of course you know, we were talking about, again, disturb the distortions at the level of a wavelength. Right? We don't need a mirror that moves here by a centimeter up and down. We need a, wave, a, a mirror that just moves by a few micrometers. And the piezo electric crystals, they do this very nicely. So you build a mirror of that, and then you put in those, those piezo crystals, then you somehow need to make sure you glue them, the end to the mirror surface, and then you can apply them to the individual piezos here, you apply voltages, and then depending on the voltage you apply, it will move the mirror up or down. So is there a difference between the blue, the blue mirror sheet and the red ones? Here? Yes. Yeah. Oh no, it's just a different color. Right, again, the first, the first mirror I've seen in, in, in my career was actually by a group in Chicago where they had a PhD student who was building one. And it's red ones also. So Difficult, right? You go to the machine shop and you ask for a piece of metal with a couple of holes in there. And then in those holes you stick in your, your piezoelectric crystals. I should say, however, that, that they are very sensitive, so many of them break if you don't uh, pulse it electrically. And so he had a big shelf there with, with hundreds of those little crystals and he was characterizing them all and then putting them in and if they didn't work, replacing them. But it was for years he was working on that. Uh, but if, if you're a kid, you can put some glue there and, and have a thin... Of course, the mirror here on top has to be a relatively thin mirror. It can be too thin, right? It can be like the, the, sort of the aluminum foil that you can use in your household because that's too thin, right? It would just change its shape in between those, those actuators. So it has to be stiff over the scales between those actuators. But then it needs to be flexible enough that you can actually deform it, right? If you take a thick glass plate here, and deform it, it will just break. So those mirrors are actually the most common ones now. And you can buy them now as commercial products. Again, they're not, not uh, uh, if you get a good one here, you probably also spend something like 50 pesos. Excuse me, what it says next to uh, Pisa in the second image? Sorry? In the second image. In? Second. This one. Next one. Uh, next to Pisa plus what? Filter. Oh, yes. I mean, you can, you can imagine that you have in the simplest case some device with mirrors that are just sticking out back and forth. And that helps, sort of. But if you have one that is not just going up, but also producing some tilt of that, that surface, then of course, I mean, here you see the tilt, right? That's, that's a much better approximation. So these are much better, but you need twice as many, or even more, three times as many, uh, 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 control for degrees of freedom. Because obviously here you just say, hey, move up or down. In this case, we have to say, hey, move and kill. Okay. Now, I should say, this is not in your handout, I just had that illustration because I realized that I didn't show a single image of an adaptive optics system. Just <laughs> So this is, I believe, uh, and I should, should remember that because I've been there, the polymer telescope with the adaptive optics 
system mounted at the chemical purpose. The handle. The handle. Wow. And so you have in the chemical focus, you add a big optical edge. Here is another example. So this is how it appears your telescope. And then you have some optics here, and then this big box here. This is essentially a container. Well, it's, it's covered so that it's not all the dust and so coming in. And uh, you have your optical system here. And so you need the adaptive optic system between your telescope and uh, the science instrument, camera or the spectrum. Right? Because this is where you want to control or correct the wavefront before it gets to the science instrument. But it's a big thing you add. Okay, there is a very common confusion about the adaptive, adaptive optics. Is that they act on the menu, the on the object, but they are not actually placed below the menu, right? Well, here they're placed below the menu, but of course they're always re-imaging. But, but the actuators are not acting on the main mirror. They are not acting on the main mirror. So this one here. Okay. okay. So what? Now this is a very important. So in principle, you could imagine that you would. And that would be the most elegant one. That you would have an adaptive optic system that acts on your main mirror. Right? That moves your that moves your main mirror and puts it in shape in milliseconds on scales of 50 centimeters. Only that it is not practical. We know how difficult it is to build big telescope mirrors. And so you want to stay, have them stay in shape as good as possible. And what is then happening is you do the correction of the wavefront somewhere else. In this case, in this case, you re-image it. Meaning that you have the object, the infinity, you have the pupil, you have the telescope, you have the image, and the image is somewhere here, somewhere here. That's the focal plane. And then you have another couple of lenses here that then take the image of the telescope as the object, and then have another pupil in between, and then the detector, your science instrument, and the image plane. And it is in this pupil. So the second pupil, which is actually an image of the pupil of the telescope. Right, so you, you just re, I mean, you can imagine you just re-image it. It's like, like putting a couple of, of, of binoculars uh, uh, behind each other. I'm not sure it's a good example. But I mean, you can repeat an optical system, of course, a couple of times. And you would just re-image things if you do it right. And this is done here. So the pupil where this mirror is placed is actually not the pupil of the, but it's the pupil of the telescope, but the really big pupil of the telescope. It's not the primary mirror. The other possibility, and this is why I'm going to do here, is of course it would be nice if we had that only integrated in the telescope. And we said that we cannot do it on the primary mirror because it's too complicated. The secondary mirror is a lot smaller. It's easier to access. A lot, a lot of things get simpler, and we could. And it's still close to the pupil. It's not an image plane. It's the secondary mirror optically is still very close to the pupil. In fact, in some telescopes, it's the secondary mirror that defines the beam diameter, and therefore, by definition, will be the pupil. And so people have developed adaptive secondary mirrors. This is now uh, done for the people. Yesterday we saw the large binocular telescope in Arizona, as well as the, the MMT, the multi mirror telescope uh, in Arizona. Uh, there is also an ESOIS currently uh, building its, its uh, own secondary mirror that will be, I think, for the telescope at the end of the year. So the idea is to have a defoldable mirror as an integral part of the telescope. So you, you get rid, essentially, of those add-on optics here, and you already 
by the time you get to the focal plane of the telescope, you already have a corrected image. And this, is, this can be done then with an the adaptive secondary mirror. Okay, this is just to show you how this works, or how this looks like, or scale, these are two human beings. Yeah. Uh, so you have, this is the base frame, and you have those actuators here. When they're large, they usually not be so electric actuators anymore, they're really voice points, sort of like in loudspeakers, where you can then uh, control the electromagnetically. And they will push or pull on a, on a thin reference sphere. And this is your mirror. So this, is, this is now looking up. This is looking down as if it were mounted on the telescope. So what you see here are the telescope spiders. This is an old fixed with a hexapod structure that controls the overall alignment. And you have some support frames here. The problem is that all these actuators produce a lot of heat. And so, they, so that's of course horrible. Because we know that any heat source in the beam will produce turbulence. And we built an adaptive optic system to reduce the turbulence. And now we need to build a heat source there. Now you may say that's not much, but this could easily be a few hundred watts. And this is like the heater you use in, in the room. Imagine if we're both here. And, and then you would need a heater. This is the power that you need, but typically a few hundred watts. And this is what they put right in the middle of the telescope. So you need a cooling system. But of course, the, the, the beauty of that is it's part of the telescope. We don't have extra optics. The disadvantage is that it's much more difficult to build and control. Because I remember there were, there were already two of those mirrors. This is a tiny, tiny thin shell of glass with a 60 or 80 centimeters in diameter. And this is not easy to handle. The first one that was shipped from Arizona to, to Hachikri Observatory in Italy broke. And, and some other were also difficult to handle. I mean, it's, you polish on the mirror for, for a year or two and then, then it's broken. It's uh, frustrating if you want But do you basically by some non-adaptive -adapt systems? Oh, no. That, um, oh, well, of course. I mean, if you plan to do that, you better make sure there is a conventional secondary mirror there as well. And what about the vibration that the system could produce? Ah, yeah, that's... Um, well, of course, it's a, it's a matter of smart design. But, uh, uh, yes, you, uh, and, and damping here, you should not have this that total of vibration. Okay, so far, now we know how to do this approximately. We know how the wavefront sensor works, we know how to measure the wavefront. We know how the deformable mirror looks like, and we know what the computer has to do. It has to take the wavefront information, has to then come up with a model to say, well, it's so much of that certain term, and so much of that one, and so much of that one, from the measurements, and then send that information to the mirror. Fine. Now, why is it still not perfect? And uh, uh, so maybe, maybe you can see some moving in the terminal to like this. Uh, this is just a, a, uh, a movie of, and I thought I'll show the Galactic Center, since we saw the Galactic Center yesterday night in Helena's nice talk. So this is, I mean, this is seen in the now. And then you turn off adaptive optics, and it improves. But it's still not perfect. And, and there are a couple of reasons why, I mean, if it were perfect, right, the point should be smaller, you don't have this, this fuzzy structure, but instead we would expect, what would we expect around this uh, uh, What, 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 what information? If this were perfect, how would we expect the stars to look like? Here it is. But with an infinite aperture or? No, with the tank aperture of, of whatever, 10 meters. I mean, what, what's, what's missing here? 
that I would expect from any diffraction limited image. Here you can find. Sorry? Here you can find. The profile, the area profile. The, the area profile, right. But most, I mean, essentially the diffraction rings. The diffraction rings. Right. So if you don't see the rings around the point source, you know it's not diffraction for uh, any round aperture or closed. Right, so this is good. Obviously, you gain a lot, but it's not perfect. I have a question about this. The, this pilot the rock in the previous why the why the line was concentrated in the corner and not in the position of the right stuff? Um. It just yeah, commences. Mm -hmm. The line mm -hmm. is concentrated in the left. Here. Mm -hmm. No, no, in the same image. Yes. Oh, why is it here? Look at the light the star. Yes, this one. Yes, but the light is concentrated in no. the corner. Oh, you're saying why is this different from here? Um, okay. I mean, that's maybe there is a second star. Okay. Uh, yes. I expect that the most of the light. I think what you see here, I think this source here yes. is, is too faint. It's completely yeah. disappearing in open loop. And what you see now here ah, yes. is the halo from the star. Yes. Uh, what is the size of this, of the inset? Is this less than one second apart? I think this is 0.8 hour seconds, yes. Well, then it, it's, it's very near to the diffraction limit because the images are very small. It's near. Because well, it's we, not, okay. But it's not so far either from the diffraction limit. Well, halo is working, but there is, there is one one important aspect, maybe it's leading too far, when you have an adaptive optic system, it will always give you, uh, it will often give you a core that is narrow. But, so I mean, adaptive optic systems usually don't work uh, like making the source smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, if it works better, if it works twice as good, it's only half the size. That's not how it works. They will always put some light in a relatively, relatively narrow core, but then miss to put the remaining light into that narrow core. So you would get, and this is where the idea of the stray ratio comes back. So even if you have a stray ratio of say 30%, meaning that you're missing 70% of the light in, of here, so 70% of the light that should be here, is just in a larger halo but you would still get a very narrow set. We can, we can discuss that offline. And this was a thing with what? Tip, 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 or... Uh, no, this is full adaptive with the, optics. With the adaptive optics in the, this is in the full adaptive main optics. mirror, with the secondary mirror, or what? Uh, with an extra AO system behind the focal plane. Behind what? Behind the telescope focus. So this is an extra... This is like for Palomar, the pictures I showed you. An extra AO system added to Okay, and the reason why it's not perfect is that you have to, I mean, this is for your information. For future reference, for light formulae, whatever. This will not be part of the test, the right part. But nevertheless, I thought I should add it because some of the errors that are important <laughs> in this game are fitting errors. Remember, we are approximating the true way. We don't have a perfect fit. This is what the mirror does. The mirror is not perfect, so there are some residuals. Then, we have, of course, a, a uh, we measure the turbulence, but we, by the time we, we apply the correction, some time has passed. And so, we have to be very quick, but of course, we have to do a lot of computations for a complex system. And so we may not be quick enough. There are temporal errors, that means by the time we apply the correction for the wavefront, the atmosphere has already changed and we're applying the wrong correction. So these are the temporal errors. Then there are measurement errors. And this is 
essentially given by the signal to noise of the wavelength sensor. Now, if we get back here, the problem is how do you measure the wavefront? Before we said, oh, we put a star at infinity, but there is no bright star in the field. So where does the wavefront sensor get the information? You know, it has to pick one of the stars, maybe that one, that seems to be the brightest star here in the field, and use that one for, for wavefront sensing, but still, this galactic center region is very faint. There is no bright star. So we don't get many photons in the measurement on our wavefront sensor. And so if we, we have only exposed milliseconds, we can actually, this is, this is easy to make a, a computation. You can, you can actually, if you like to do some voluntary homework, and I'm sure you all do, then you can just say, well, if I have an 18th magnitude star, or a 15th magnitude star, and I observe in the visible certain bandwidth, how many photons do I actually get per second? And it's not that many, maybe a couple of thousand. But then you just divide those couple of thousand photons that you get per second. You divide, you don't expose for one second, right? Remember coherence time of the atmosphere. So you expose only so for 10 milliseconds. So you have to divide the number by 100. And then you have to remember for the Czech Hartmann sensor, we don't use the full aperture, we subdivide the aperture with the lenses in smaller pieces. So you have to also divide the number further by the number of sub apertures. And then you're left with a couple of photons only per millisecond per sub aperture. And this is what your measurement is. So this is noisy. There are also calibration errors, and that's that's actually I should go back to the, to the that's very simple. You have a beam splitter here, and all the control does is to correct for aberrations within this part of the system. It will not know, of course, whatever is happening behind that beam splitter. Right? It gets no the the wavefront sensor gets no it gets only the information from the system down to here. Will not get information over here. So if you if you have a camera mounted to your adaptive optic system that has some aberrations included, the AO system wouldn't know about it. So you cannot correct for it. And then finally we have this, this term called anti-sonatism. And this is what was sorry I may erase it. But this is simply because you look in one direction and you measure the wavefront in the other direction. I mean, in this case, for example, let's come back here. Why is there the square here? Because this is the most interesting region, arguably, in our galaxy. This is where the supermassive black hole is, Sagittarius A star. So we want to see what's happening here. But we don't have a wavefront reference. We don't have a bright star there that tells us what the distortion is. So we need to look for the next bright star. Again, I said maybe we use that one here. That's a few arc seconds away. And this is where the isoplanetism comes in, what I've drawn before. You look through, you look through a different part of the, of the atmosphere. And this is illustrated here. Well, first of all, to show you that I'm, I'm not, not telling you a, a crazy story, this is the distance here, 1.35.7, 10 arc seconds, 15 arc seconds, 18, 23, 27, 30, 36. This is just taken take from a star cluster, where some, we correct the wavefront from using a star in the center. Our wavefront sensor looks at the star in the center of the field. And then we look at how the, 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 the stars look like, the images of the stars when we go further out in the field. And this is what's happening. I mean, you can see this one still looks very point light. This one is a blurred dot. So clearly, the correction we apply for the star here does not correct fully uh, for the turbulence that the star is suffering. This is, this is uh, illustrated here. Uh, let's say this is our this is our central star. This is what we the star we use for the wavefront reference. So the light comes in through this light cone here, and it's 
all focus on, on this part here for the wavefront sensor. And then, but of course, the wavefront sensor only sees this star, but we take, say, a wider field of the image. We want to have a real image of the sky, so we have a larger focal plane here. And that star here, first, will come to life on this position on the focal plane. Well, obviously, it's at some distance from the other star. So we see it here at some distance from the other star. And the light from the star, of course, passes through a different column of the atmosphere. And there is this part of the residual turbulence. Whatever happens there, the wavefront sensor will not know. Right? Because it's outside the field of the wavefront And this is a severe limitation to wide field. So, and it's not, it's not large. This isoplanetic angle is just whatever, 10 to 20 arc seconds. 20, 10 to 20, it depends on the wavelengths. And so the shorter the wavelengths, the smaller the angle. Okay. Now, if you look for exoplanets, you're fine. Because <laughs> they're smaller than an arc second anyway. But of course, if you want to study whatever globular clusters, it's a real problem. You have a large field, you have many point sources, and the point spread function of each of those sources looks different with increasing radius. What is the widest field, uh, for example, of the, the Hubble telescope? This is the wide field of one time. This is the, the wide field. The, or 
learning in that you have to point your telescope 250 times until you find once, statistically, a bright star in your field. That sucks. <laughs> but of course you can say, well, I will thank you. 15th magnitude. And, okay, I didn't tell you, but for most adaptive optic systems to work properly with the Jack Hartman Breakdown Sensor, the magnitude limit is somewhere here. 13th, 14th magnitude. So if you want to find a bright guy star in your field, and if it's not the reference star. So again, if you hunt for exoplanets, you're lucky. Because you will always have a bright star in the field. Right? Unless you look for some, some weird life form in outer space where you have a planet without a star. <laughs> okay, but in that case it's easy. But for most other cases, if you have your 13th, 14th magnitude uh, 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 requirement, because otherwise the wavefront sensor will not be able to measure anything, it gets too faint. That means that you only have a probability here of say 1% that you really have a bright star. So, meaning 99 out of 100 cases, you cannot observe what you want with the depth of optical. Unless your star is bright. And this is where the laser guys start. So people came up with the idea. If we don't have our star in the field, we'll make our own one. We we'll shoot up a laser and we'll focus it to some light and then look at it. And the light that comes back also travels through the atmosphere and we can measure the turbulence. Uh, there are two different concepts that are very common. One is so sodium laser guide star and one is a radio beacon guide star. The latter one is essentially at an altitude of about 10 kilometers, whereas the sodium goes up to, to almost 100 kilometers in altitude. And uh, let me go to them one by one. It turns out that there is at about this 95 kilometers height a, a layer of no neutral sodium in the mesosphere of our atmosphere. So an increased concentration of sodium. Now, I, I can tell you exactly why there is no kinds of theories about deposition from meteorites and, and, and uh, whatever. Um, the, yes, but there, is also, there are also some, some variations with season which are independent of the meteorite. In any case, we shoot up a laser, a narrow, narrow frequency laser that is tuned to this uh, resonance line of sodium at 400, sorry, 589 nanometers. And then we get resonance gathering at this altitude, uh, yeah, at this altitude of 95 kilometers. First thing in the air, of course, is, has some finite extent that will be something like 10 kilometers. But if you do that, and then you have a star produced here by by resonance scattering, your resonance, and uh, you can observe it. Then the, the, the spot 
that you produce is actually then not here, but here. Because the laser is going to be tilted away from and then, then produced here. And then, of course, it will shine back through the same I mean, speed of light, short compared to the, to the coherent side of the atmosphere. Much faster than the equivalent. And, and so we would not notice that. And so laser guide stars still need a faint reference star in addition. But maybe this is going too far. Just assume this is working. And the other possibility is to take a Rayleigh beacon. Now, the problem with wide drive, okay, this is, this is nice because it's high up in the atmosphere. Most of the turbulence occurs at lower levels. So this is very high up there, this is very nice. The problem is the return depends on the concentration of sodium there, which is seasonally variable and has some, some downsides. And, uh, the distance here, in the end you measure that, you make an image of that in your wavefront, but the distance to the sodium layer unfortunately depends of course on your zenith thing. And so if you look, if you look to zenith, this is 90 kilometers away. If you look near the horizon, you have another cosine factor of your zenith angle in the wall. So this is then suddenly whatever 150 kilometers. So you need to adjust the focus of your aosis. This is sometimes a, a serious problem. So people have been thinking about other solutions, which also you can use very high power lasers in this case. But then you essentially you just shoot up the laser, and you get just rainy scattering of the atmosphere. Right? You just shine the laser into the atmosphere, and all the of course, radius scattering is mostly forward scattering, but some of the light will be back scattered. And this is the light. Now, uh, <laughs> from what I explained to you now, you would think, if you follow it, you should think that this is not working. Why? You remember in the sodium layer, uh, the guys were case. We have a well-defined layer at 95 kilometers distance. This is where we have the resonance scatter effect, where we reproduce our star. In this case, for the radiant scattering, well, it's scattering from atmospheric molecules. But the atmosphere is everywhere. Right? The atmosphere is here and here and here and here. No one gets scattering from everywhere along the line of sight. So how can we make sure that we get only backscatter from a distant high up in the atmosphere? Well, we get it. It's unavoidable that we get it from everywhere. But what we can do is to send laser pulses, microsecond laser pulses. And OK, you know the speed of light. And you can figure out how long does it take for the light to travel from here to a height of 10 kilometers. You have the pulses of your laser, and then you, uh, you, you uh, uh, place the, the readout of your wavefront sensor exactly with the time when you know, oh, now my light, my light pulse has reached 10 kilometers long. And then you would not measure this backscatter from here, but you measure it from 10, by 10 kilometers. Well, if you make it much lower, then you don't send any of the atmosphere up high. If you go much further, well, there is not much, uh, there are not many molecules left to backscatter, right? That's the reason why whatever the bigger airplanes fly at 10 kilometers and not at 20 kilometers, because the density of the air is too low. Okay, so thank you for this best compromise between best scattering signal and uh, far away out to get most of the turbulence included. But then you need to use laser pulses and you need to time those laser pulses with the readout of your wavefront sensor. However, the lower you suck your, your uh, laser here, you add another problem. And that's the uh, that's the, the anisotropism. Let me just say one problem is, and 
that was the part that I was referring to. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, what is it? 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 Oh, the, 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 well, it is, it is so, you know, you, you, uh, I mean, it's some, some. Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, well, you need some, so, you know, if you're in your laser, So you just see that you just see a uh, an orange gray. Yeah. They are using the solution. Yes. Yeah. But if they are green, something or blue, uh, then then it's probably some light show over the surface. Because the there are the astronomical lasers, they have to be defined to the to the sodium layer, so they're orange. And the radii lights, or they're also UV lasers, but the radii are usually broadband. Some, some, they're more bluish. It's actually that in the early days, uh, they had been problems for air tracking. So at some point, uh, uh, some, uh, well, that was actually over Las Vegas, that a pilot was blinded temporarily for a few minutes by being hit from a laser. And then, then the air traffic uh, uh, controls, they were all worried that astronomers do something similar and the plane crashes. And so... Uh, so this laser was from somebody else, not so from astronomers? No, no, not from astronomers, but of course uh, then yeah. all the, the laser guys or systems now have to have some system that watches out for airplanes. I mean, you just need a wide field CCD and you see, of course, when the airplane is coming. I mean, when something is moving fast, essentially on the sky, it would be anything you would go over. <laughs> right? But in that case, then it shuts down, it closes the shutter, and, and so the laser disappears. That's usually the same as the stuff we have. Okay, uh, so what we said before is uh, there is the problem that you will not be able to sense the tip tilt turn with the laser, so you still need a natural guide star just for this tip tilt component. But in that case, for reasons we don't need to discuss now, this, the guide star can be much fainter, so it will still be a bit helpful. The other thing is, there is this focus anisoplanetism, which is very similar to the, to the anisoplanetism we, we, we discussed before. In this case, it means that if, if your source is at infinity, right, you have a, a straight column. The parallel light from the star of infinity will travel through the atmosphere before it hits your primary curve. However, if your star, if your guide star is only at 10 kilometers high, then you will only get this cone here, right? That's the light from the star. Only the light inside this, this cone here from the star will reach the telescope. Uh, so we will not be able to sample the turbulence out here. And that's the same problem that we had before, a slightly different way, by having the, the field points be corrected in a different way. So if you have a large field, you get this uh, isoplanetic uh, error, or an isoplanetic error, and this is something very similar. The solution to that, and of course, this is this is a very simple geometric ratio. If you move that, that star higher, the problem disappears. If you make the mirror smaller, the problem disappears. But of course, if you're stuck here, say, at 90 kilometers, because this is where your sodium layer is, and if you want to build big telescopes, the ratio here between simply because the size of the telescope, the distance from the guide star, from the laser guide star, that ratio becomes less and less useful, meaning that you have more and more of this turbulence out here in the outer part, outside of this cone here, that is not sampled, and the only way to fix it is to use multiple laser guide stars. Now it becomes very interesting, because now you have to shoot, for big telescopes, you have to shoot several guide stars in this 
And each of those guide stars, of course, needs it separate away from the sensor. And then you need a smart computer or an algorithm that actually combines the information from that uh, as the star with the information from that star and the information from that star, right? You can't just co-edit it. You can then actually, if you have different measurements, reconstruct how the atmosphere looks in different layers. You see, have this extra information. Okay, so for the remaining five minutes, now with all that, I don't know all the details now on the air systems work. I would just like give you a two to force, just one minute per system, <laughs> to show you that, and if you're really interested, you can ask me on all these individual ones, but uh, just to show you that there is no one single, one fits all that every company system. They all have to be optimized because of the limitations that we discussed. They all have to be optimized for the specific application. There is one system that's called the ground layer in your system, uh, which uses the fact that most of the turbulence, that, that go back to our very first lecture on, on atmospheric turbulence, where we talked about the C and square profile, and we said, well, the turbulence is not uniformly distributed along the, along the line of sight of the atmosphere. Most of that actually comes from a layer pretty much pretty close to the ground. So that's called the ground layer. And you can build and design an AO system that only corrects for the ground layer. And the closer you get with that correction to the ground, the larger the field of view of the AO system will be. Because, uh, because it's the atmosphere that is up here that outside the central light cone that is not included anyway. So we only correct for the turbulence that's close to the ground. So by definition, we will not get a good correction, but we get a large field. Okay. So this is more like a C improvement system. And many, many telescopes, because it's simple, it's relatively simple, many telescopes nowadays talk about ground layer. So that means you only correct the lowest layer of turbulence, you can have a larger field of view, but your correction is nowhere very good. Then you can have a system that's called laser tomography. This is sort of the one that I indicated uh, that were showed with the laser guide stars before. Maybe where you have not just one reference source, but you have several sources. And this is this is really tomography. I mean if you if you ever had the the pleasure to go to a hospital and, and get a sort of a, a, a tomography uh, made of your, your parts of your body or so. And this is a similar way they use x-rays or whatever to shine through or some, some nuclear resonance and then from different directions. And if you combine the information from the various measurements, you can reconstruct the actual spatial distribution of your body side for the atmospheric turbulence. And so, yeah, this is the, the laser tomography. It requires several guide stars, it requires several wavefront sensors, and then you combine the information and you control one deformable mirror. And you have multi-conjugate adaptive optic systems. And that means multiple, multi-conjugate means that you have several deformable mirrors. Before we said, well, the approximation of the wavefront is never perfect. But if we had several, they could actually be conjugated to different heights where the most uh, turbulence occurs. So again, you need several reference stars, several wavefront sensors, but now you have multiple deformable mirrors. And that now will give you a larger field of view. Because now you, you are able to correct for the light to this direction as well as for this. And what we said before is the major limitation of a single adaptive optic system, namely that the image quality is bad, it gets worse the further you go from the optical axis. This you can overcome with such a system where you have multiple 
guide stars and multiple vulnerable mirrors. And this is illustrating, this is maybe the best part to show that. This is a scene limited image at JPEG. These were all measurements provided by these Seeing carbon arc segment at 1.2 micrometers wavelengths, this is the image of about a thousand stars. Full width path max of the star is 0.4 arc seconds, so it looks pretty bad. Now we use a single and the simplest adaptive optics system you can think of. Same wavelengths, and this is what you get. I mean, it's not like you have a hole here and there are no stars. If you look careful, there are lots of stars that just get so tiny that they're hard to see, but they're perfect point sources here, most of them. But then when you go radially outward from the center, it gets worse. If you, the further you go, the more you get back to the, to the scene limit in place. So the whole is confused because the correction is better. Yes, yes. I mean, if you, if you don't believe me, you have to come close, and you see there are lots of just tiny spots in the center. <laughs> <laughs> Powerful computer 